All right. So it's 1230. Um, we'll get started. And the way we're going to do this is um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to pop those up into chat. Um, I did get questions from somebody who probably cannot be here. So um, if there are no questions, I'll probably start going through those. The first thing, though, um, that I want to dive into is just like um, from the lecture where I couldn't be there and I just had the lecture videos, what to really focus on for that series of lecture. Because um, for all the lectures where I was able to record something, um, you know, I usually trim it down and put emphasis on things to study for. Um, so let me kind of do that. And what I've done is I've just basically combined all the slides on the test into one master slide. So when we go through that, um, so yeah, let me just, okay. So it was the, um, start of 25.6, where we look at homologous recombination, um, looking at transposons. And this is the set, a uh, series of PowerPoints that go with our problem set reading guide, whatever you want to call it, 19. Um, so that's what I'm talking about here. Um, and the date, uh, that would have been the 15th. Um, so Thursday, the 15th. And so I would like you to know um, the crossing over the holiday model. So um, be sure you can like explain you know, what crossing over is, how it can form, what a holiday junction is. And that's basically this slide and what's going over right there. So um, make sure you, you know A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, what's going on in these slides in the PowerPoint here has those, like it's explaining what each image does. Um, and the next series of like PowerPoints where I go in depth into what the proteins do, um, really, I just want you to know what their function is, right? Um, so REC A, REC A, its function is uh, recombination because that is um, the, the big theme for those series of lectures. And they're really gonna help in the recombination process. Um, you don't need to know the actual diagram like shown here. That's why I have big old skip, right? So this process diagram of how REC A can mediate this process, we don't need to know the exact details of that. Um, but like I said, uh, I would like you to know that REC A is a part of this process. And the uh, eukaryotic version is RAD51, but I'll get to that in a second. So we can kind of skip this whole idea of a three, uh, three strands going in, two coming out. Um, so Here's like a good slide to really focus on. It's telling you the what each protein's doing. So that's why I have a giant no there. So REC BCD, they are gonna make single-stranded uh, DNA for REC A to bind. These are SOS genes. And SOS genes are those that are turned on uh, when the cell's about to die. Um, SOS, save our ship genes, right? And so when you have like a break in DNA and your replication fork collapses, because if, if you have a break in DNA, your replication fork can't move past that, um, sometimes these genes are activated. Um, and we're gonna do that crossover event. So what REC A does is that it'll bind to uh, single-stranded DNA. REC B, C, and D will make that single-stranded DNA for REC A to bind. So make sure like you just know the function, like what are these doing in recombination? Um, the structure, no need to like memorize anything about that. I'm not really gonna be focusing on 
protein structures all that much, um, more the processes. So that's why we have a giant skip here for the REC uh, BCD structure and how it interacts with DNA. Although there is one structure that I would kind of like you to know, and it's how the holiday junction um, actually forms using RUVA. Uh, so RUVA is a heterotetramer. And since it's buying, this is how we're making our holiday junction. And the holiday junction is when we have that crossover event. And this is really how we're having that crossover happen, um, where the DNA is going to bind to positive amino acids. But in the center here, you have negatively charged amino acids. That's pushing the DNA apart. And that's kind of like how we're doing this junction. For example, like green and yellow is one strand of the DNA, a blue and purple is another strand. They're being fed in. These negatively charged amino acids are pushing the double strand of the DNA apart, and then they uh, combine with a new partner, which is in effect what um, you know the holiday junction in our crossover event is doing. It's crossing over different strands of DNA. We don't need to like really focus in on rub B. Um, rub A is going to be like what's kind of going on here. Um, these diagrams, um, as a favor to you, since I wasn't there, and I figure most, if not all of you, are planning to graduate soonish. Usually, Biochem 2 is like one of the last classes you take um, to make your lives a little bit easier since we have a lot of stuff to study anyways for this test, uh, we can kind of skip these, uh, the actual uh, single strand and double strand repair mechanisms. Except I would like you to know um, the names of RAD51 and BRCA, uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2. And it should be BRCA, not BRAC. So let me just, that should be BRCA. Okay, so let me just say the thing you need to know about this. Uh, RAD51 is a, uh, the single-stranded uh, DNA binding protein when it comes to double-stranded repair. It's basically RevA in prokaryotes. So RevA was the single-stranded binding protein in prokaryotes. RAD51 um, is, is the eukaryotic version. And they interact with two proteins known as BRCA1 and BRCA2. And the reason why I want you to know these names is because they're very prevalent in cancer. Um, so loss or mutation of these BRCA genes um, is one of the like major things that causes breast cancer. Uh, I believe it's BRCA2. I might be wrong on that, but it's loss of one of the BRCAs. Um, leads to a huge increase to the chance of you getting breast cancer. Uh, ovarian, prostate, pancreatic cancers, um, RAD51, BRCA1, or BRCA2, mutation of any of these proteins, loss of function of any of these proteins, really causes this increase in cancer because what RAD51 is really doing is if you have a double-stranded break in your DNA, which happens a lot in your cells, RAD51 with these BRCA proteins help to direct our holiday junction. And again, the holiday junction is our crossover here. And with that, we can repair our DNA. If you don't have this protein or the helper, helper's BRCA, you're going to be left with this. Um, and honestly, one way to fix it is just to fill in random nucleotides, which is what you will do if, if you can't repair double-stranded DNA any other way, the cell will die or just put in random nucleotides there, leads to mutation, which leads to cancer. So that's why I kind of just want to uh, focus in on that. That's why it says partial skip up there. Uh, CRISPR system, super important. Um, uh, it's going to be around uh, our lives, you know, for the foreseeable future. 
So um, I will ask you questions on CRISPR. So make sure you go over these slides. Um, know how CRISPR works. Um, know how the CRISPR-Cas9 system works. So just read those over. If you have questions about that, uh, for sure uh, ask me. Um, but since we are doing so much on CRISPR, we can skip transposons, transposable um, uh, sequences in the DNA. Um, so just focus on CRISPR, skip the transposons. Um, so anything that says transposon, uh, feel free to skip. And also uh, chromosomal rearrangement by a recombination, save you some time and skip that. Just focus on the CRISPR for now. Um, but yeah, that's all I wanted to say about problem set 19. Um, and what I can do is that I will, um, so this is just like a master slideshow I made of all the slides from class for test four. Um, I'll put this in the test four folder in case you couldn't write that down or in case you, you feel nervous and like, did I write skip on the right thing or not? So I'll put this in so you'll see which ones I wrote no, which ones I wrote skip. Um, so that'll help you out. But with that, that's the main thing I wanted to cover about problem set 19, the one we didn't go over in class. So let me open the floor now to uh, questions uh, anybody might have about uh, anything at all. And if there aren't any questions in chat, like I said, I can just go to that list of questions I got and start going over them point by point. Um, so it's not really a question, but can you go over our exam schedule? Sure. So the exam schedule, uh, test four, and I'm actually feeling a, a little generous here. So what I'll say is that, um, you know, originally test four is scheduled for Thursday, uh, April 29th. And it was going to be the deal of opens at 11 or 12 a.m., closes at midnight. What I'll do, since it is the last week of classes, is I'll be a little more generous and say, you can take it up to Friday, April 30th at midnight. Whoops, that's my pen going wild there. So if you're planning on taking a Thursday, you took the time off for Thursday, uh, you can still take Thursday, um, but it'll be available Friday till midnight. Our final exam is kind of the same deal in that um, it's May 6th to May 7th, and you can take it anytime you want from there. Uh, no new material on the final exam, 100% old material. So make sure you go through the old tests and look through those. And what we can do, um, I'll, I will put up like a sign up, not a sign up sheet, but I'll try to poll people about a time next week, Monday through Wednesday, where like a majority of people could be available. And we can have a Zoom um, final exam review again, if you have questions. Uh, we can go over those questions. So um, I'll plan for that. But yeah, that that's the timeline of our tests. Yeah, no problem. Um, all right, so let me let me go through some of the questions I got via email in case you're still typing out. Um, so question one. Uh, what will exam four cover again? Like what section? So as always, um, what exam four will cover is you can be found in the test four folder on Blackboard. Um, but I believe the actual sections in your book are chapter 25, section two through chapter 25, section six, and then chapter 26, section one through 26, uh, section three. 
that's what I have the PowerPoints labeled at as anyways. So um, I believe that should be correct for like what sections. Um, can we go over a quick summary of the modifications that occur during the processing of prokaryotic and eukaryotic RNA and tRNA? All right, so um, just FYI, the videos I had up for today that covers RNA, tRNA, and codons, um, that reading guide was like um, extra credit if you did it. So I'm not gonna actually ask you um, test-wise the stuff about tRNA, rRNAs, and codons. I think it's cool stuff, um, but we're, get, we're taking that time and would have gone over it today uh, to do like our study guide. So our, our, our test review rather. So yeah, don't worry about the tRNA, rRNA stuff. mRNA are still, uh, still on the table um, for being tested on though. All right, so another question. Uh, basically, can you describe the assembly of the RNA-P2 pre-initiation complex? Um, so for that, um, I don't have much in depth to say about RNA-P2 uh, initiation complex. So let me go to RNA-P2, I believe it's, so this is, uh, here we go, eukaryotes. Um, so the thing, like RNA-P2, um, the main thing we talked about with RNA-P2 initiation is the promoter sequence. And so that, that's the one thing I would kind of like touch on a little bit. Um, there's a bunch of promoter sequences here, right? TF2B, TADA initiation, the MTE, the DPE. And don't worry about like memorizing those sequences. I don't think that's worth it. Just realize that these are called core promoter elements. And these are what are um, directing RNA2 polymerase to bind. Right? So if a gene has a Tata box, or rather, um, if a part of the DNA has a Tata box and you don't know it's a gene yet, that's a pretty good idea that it's the gene. The same with like a Tata box or an MTE. And what really happens is that um, you have a sigma element, and this is similar to what happens in the prokaryotic version. You have a sigma element of RNA polymerase that will come and bind these initiator complexes. And there's a lot of proteins that are involved in this. So we didn't really go over the proteins themselves. Um, but sigma is going to be the thing that really starts it starts off this binding. Because um, we did talk about that a little bit when it comes to mRNA, and I'm going to be jumping around here. Um, at least I thought we did. Where we were talking about um, abortive initiation where um, you know the sigma is bound so tightly to your promoter. And that I guess we talked about that in prokaryotic. So let me skip back there. Where did we talk about that? Yeah, so initiation here. So even though what we're talking about initiation for the RNAP, uh, this was all prokaryotic stuff. Um, this was the prokaryotic system, rather. I should probably not say stuff. Uh, but a lot of what we learn about RNA-P for prokaryotes transfers to eukaryotes. That is, the pro uh, eukaryotic version also has a sigma factor that will bind a promoter element and help to open it up. Um, you also have this idea of abortive ignition, where the RNAP won't leave the uh, promoter um, because the sigma is so strongly bound to the, uh, uh, the initiation sequence. Um, some different things though, for eukaryotic, 
because remember eukaryotic have RNA P is that eukaryotic has this C terminal domain. And this is very important. Um, go back to the mRNA slides and look like at all the things it interacts with. So it's big on interacting with the mRNA uh, machinery to really get this process. But if we're just talking about initiation, right? Um, you will initiate your transcription only if your C terminus domain is unphosphorylated. And then once you have phosphates, that's when this machinery starts to go. So the C terminal domain, uh, that phosphorylation system is really key in controlling transcription. And it's also key in um, binding different proteins. So I would say just in that question in total, um, the initiation complex, uh, we glossed over a lot because it's very complex. Just know those key things I talked about and probably uh, the elongation complex, which we're looking at right here, that would probably be um, more focused on, you might get a couple more questions about that. Uh, what the best way to keep prokaryotic and eukaryotic DNA RNA mechanisms straight is to just chart everything. Um, that's, I mean, that's an effective way to do it. Um, if you just want to make like columns and say, okay, prokaryotic, eukaryotic, then DNA versus RNA uh, uh, elongations, because there are a lot of things that are similar but there's also a fair amount of things that are different, different. And both of these are reading like DNA. So it can get confusing. And these all kind of look the same, the proteins. Um, so yeah, I think that's very, uh, would be a very effective study tool. It should just like go through, make like um, charts or what, what have you, and just say, you know, what does each one do? And see if you can spot like the similarities or differences. Um, I probably won't straight up ask you a question like what are the similarities and differences? I probably won't do that, um, but I will ask you questions about the actual proteins themselves. So um, I could see, you know, getting confused on which one does which again. Also, I know you mentioned earlier that structures aren't really the focus, but knowing main things like subunit of polymerase and mRNA structures and mod should be looked at. Um, so yeah, let me, let me actually say like what I meant by structures aren't being important. I guess I was mainly focusing on the, um, um, the, the recombination machinery. Like other than this uh, Rave, like I'm not gonna ask you anything else like structurally about that. Um, let me just go back here. We will, I will probably ask you questions about the structure of our polymerases because um, we went over that a ton. Um, like, let me going all the way back to the beginning of like chapter four, like the clean out fragment, like um, what's happening there when it binds DNA, right? The, the claws like clamp down. That's one way we can hold the DNA. Um, it has exonuclease activities. Um, so, so know how like that's important. Um, but I would not ask you like, where is the exonuclease activity located, right? You should know what, a, what I mean by clean all fragment. You should know basically it looks like a claw and that's to help uh, hold on to DNA. Just like with PCNA or the beta clamp that I kind of skipped over, like you should know why what the beta clamp does, what the sliding clamp does, why it's shaped like a donut and how that helps. Also for the uh, replisome, you should have a general idea of like kind of what it looks like and why it looks like it does. Um, that being said, like I would never ask you like, what's a tau uh, domain on the replisome? Cause we didn't really cover that in class but you should be able to explain to me like, okay, the prokaryotic replosome, basically what's, what is it shaped like and why is that important for replication? 
and I guess since I asked that question, let me answer it. You have a helicase that is unzipping the DNA. So that's DNA B. Attached to that helicase, you have a primase, DNA G, which is laying down your RNA primers. These are connected to your polymerase, one for the leading strand, one for the lagging strand. And this is all connected to what's called the clamp loader that is loading your beta clamp onto your lagging strand so you can continually to do your Okazaki fragments. Like that's kind of structurally what I would expect for like the replisome. And since that question was asked, um, while you think of other questions, I'm just gonna see if like any other structure like really jumps out to me about like, yeah, I'll probably ask you something about that. I mean, this is kind of a structure thing, but you should know like the different types of DNA mutations, like what they do. Um, like, a UV causes a dimer. Uh, you can do some deaminations or adding oxygens. Intercalation means that a ring structure goes in between your DNA. So that's kind of structural stuff that I would expect you to know. Like, what do those mutations do to the structure of DNA? Um, like this, this structural thing I would not ask you about. Um, like the flipping of the base into the protein. It's cool. Um, it's, it's good to know how it works, but there's a lot of other stuff to, to focus on. Um, like basically if I have pictures like that, these are mainly for um, teaching purposes. So when we go over it, I, we have something to focus on. Um, but unless I go into like it in super detail, which is why on these slides, I was being specific and saying, you know, know its function or skip this because we do go in the detail, but um, I don't, I'm not going to ask you questions on that. Uh, the one thing I will say, and I already mentioned it, is the, okay, uh, the RNAP. And let me, let me go to the eukaryotic version. Yeah, like this is a structure thing that I would probably ask you on because we did spend some time on it. I did label it out and knowing the structural units of this, um, of RNAP elongation really helps us understand how this protein works. And one of the questions I got uh, through email was, could I go over the different uh, parts of the structure again? So let me do that. So the clamp, clamp holds DNA. So when RNAP is going through, um, it needs to hold on to the DNA somehow. The clamp does that. Um, the wall makes the DNA and RNA go at a 90 degree turn to leave. So the wall directs towards the exit. 90 degrees towards the exit. The rudder separates DNA and RNA because you're making a hybrid, a DNA RNA hybrid. So you have to separate those before they can leave. That's what the rudder does. The funnel uh, uh, incorporates, incorporates uh, RNA. This is, I mean, let me explain that in a sentence because incorporates RNA is not that great of a description. This is where the new RNA nucleotides get funneled into. All right, that's the funnel. So that's where they're entering. Um, the bridge is um, uh, contacting DNA and allowing RNA in. So the bridge is really kind of um, making space in the DNA for a new RNA nucleotide to come in. And of course, metals, you should definitely know why, what's the purpose of positively charged metals and all these processes. And the answer is always the same. 
Um, it's to uh, bring together negative charges or like shield negative charges from each other and also to position negative charges, right? And all of these processes that we've talked about for the stuff on chapter four, we are creating nucleotides, right? We're creating either RNA or DNA. And doing that, we're making a new phosphate backbone. Well, phosphates are super negatively charged. And so to push, position them correctly, uh, we have a positive metal ion to help do that and also shield the charge, all the negative charges. So we can push negative charges closer together. So um, make sure you know that that's what the metal ions are doing. Any more structural stuff? I mean, an enhancer is kind of structural in that it could be far away and it makes the DNA bend to uh, contact the promoter. So that's kind of structural. Um, don't worry about like, again, this image was uh, to, to show you how complex um, everything really is. Um, so like, I would not ask you a question about like simplicin because we didn't go into it in depth. Um, you should probably know the, the ones I have listed here that interact with the mRNA though. Um, just know their names and like basically what they're doing and why they do it. Uh, the spliceosome, the splicing reaction is one structural thing I could ask you about in that just explain what's happening here. Um, I think that was another question as well. Uh, yeah, so I, one of the email questions was why is splicing trans esterification? Um, because you're making uh, an ester within a molecule itself. Um, yeah, you're just making a new ester group within the uh, actual molecule. So that's why it's called trans esterification. Um, I think, yeah, that's like the main structural things. And that reminded me when I was talking about trans esterification, uh, make sure you are looking at those study guide questions and any, any, so the study guides were like super broad, right? Cause they basically covered everything that I talked about in the videos. And then when it comes to in class time, one of the things I try to do is pare down that information a little bit to help you um, focus on what I think is the most important. So, Make sure you look over your study guides. Make sure you look at any, like, see if you can pare it down yourself. Like, is, or is there anything I didn't really talk about in class that you can chop off? Um, just because, just to let you know, um, I worked on the rough draft of the test this morning. Um, and right now it's at like 42 questions ish, uh, a lot multiple choice, but there's maybe like five or six questions. That, that come directly from the study guides where it's like copy paste. Um, so make sure you are reviewing that. Um, that's a good way to review this information. All right, but that was a lot of me talking. What else do you have? Why don't you take a drink? And there are no questions I can go back to. We have a couple more email questions. Um, what are the advantages of alternative mRNA splicing? And that's right by this slide. Uh, yeah, so uh, what are the important roles of introns? And they are one, you can make a lot of different proteins with just one gene shown here where due to alternative splicing, uh, we have one genome, one gene sequence, but based on where you are in the body, you make a different protein. So it's just a way to increase diversity uh, without increasing DNA. And two, um, it could possibly speed up uh, evolution because a lot of these, um, these exons are um, 
domains. And if you remember what a domain is from biochemistry one, it's basically like a mini protein that's part of a larger protein, right? So it's a part of the protein that has structure and function with it. And we call that a domain. Um, and so by copying these genome sequences like through a transposon, even though I told you we didn't really have to uh, know that for the test, but if these get transposed or copied, you already have like a domain ready to go and maybe that could give a protein a new function. So that's kind of like the two, two main ideas there. What else? What else uh, is on your mind? Any questions like not sure of the answer up or going through the slides? Any slides like you're not sure you want me to just like go over again? I think I got two more uh, um, email questions to answer, so I can answer that. So, um, so what are the important takeaways from comparing DNA and RNA polymerases? Um, could that possibly be a question asked on an exam as in you want a list? Um, I think I already said this, but I, I wouldn't ask you for that in a list. I did have a question relate, uh, related to that during class. And the question was, why does RNA polymerase have worse fidel fidelity than DNA polymerase? Um, that is, why does RNA polymerase make more mistakes than DNA polymerase? What's, why would that be okay, evolutionarily speaking? And the reason for that is because RNA polymerase is just making mRNA. So it's not that big of a deal if you mutate mRNA because it's going to be destroyed anyways, and you just make a couple of bad proteins. So that has a much higher error rate than DNA polymerase because if you mutate DNA, you made a change forever. There's no going back. Well, if you make a change to mRNA, uh, that, that mRNA is going to be destroyed in 20 minutes, so it's going to be okay. Can I go over the row factor? Rut row, sure. Um, where is row? Yeah, okay. So for RNAP, there are two ways that you can uh, terminate your um, RNA transcription process. One is called an intrinsic terminator. What an intrinsic terminator is, is that in, in prokaryotes, at the very end of your gene, you're gonna have a, a repeating sequence where you're gonna have a bunch of ATs and you're gonna have a GC rich palindrome region. And when you do this, you're gonna make what's called a hairpin, which is this. Okay, so a hairpin is when RNA hydrogen bonds to itself within the same strand. We call that a hairpin. So what the intrinsic terminator does is that it has a sequence in its DNA that forces RNA to form a hairpin structure. 
When it does that, RNA P will stop because like the hairpin is preventing it from moving forward. And once RNA P is stopped, then other proteins can come and kick RNA P off the DNA um, termination. And we didn't go over that at all, but that's, that's what happens there. The other way to stop RNA P is through rut row. Um, so half your genes in prokaryotes have this intrinsic terminator. Half of these need row to um, stop uh, uh, transcription. Here, what happens is that when you are transcribing RNA from DNA, this system works in a similar way as the intrinsic terminator in that there's a sequence in the DNA that when translating to RNA serves as a signal. Um, on this slide, the signal, it wasn't much of a signal, I guess. It was just, you create a hairpin to physically stop RNAP from moving. Here, with the row factor, when you translate and make RNA, that's gonna make this protein called rho bind. And once rho binds, you start the termination sequence then. And the sites that attract rho are called rut. You have a lot of Cs, um, not many Gs. So you have a lot of cysteines in a row, not a lot of Gs. Once this is made into RNA, then uh, rut will come and bind to that RNA and start the process of kicking RNAP off. So that's the, the row factor and intrinsic termination are just ways that um, uh, RNA polymerase is terminated in prokaryotes. What else? Also, people want to know about. Don't mind me, I'm just going through slides in case anything jumps out to you. So another internet question. I think you're probably going to ask what RNAP 1, 2, and 3 create. Probably a good guess because I did ask you that in class too. But are you going to ask where they occur or how they occur? Um, I'm not going to ask you where. And the only one I'm going to ask you how is RNAP 2 because we talked about that. That was the whole rudder and all that. Um, we have a whole series of slides of how RNAP2 works. So that's the only one I would kind of like ask you about, like how does RNAP do corrections? What are the A and E sites in RNAP2? Um, not, not RNAP1 and RNAP3. We're only focused on RNAP2. And are there any hints or concepts that we should double down on? Double down on? Um, I don't think so in the fact that I try to spread my questions out as best that I could. Um, so I think there's a okay representation of like each, each topic we covered for the most part. Um, so I don't think, I can't really suggest, yeah, focus on this one a lot, right? Because 
it's it's kind of equal representation of like all the topics we talked about. So what are other questions? Study guide questions, any type of questions. Anything at all. I have two questions about nutrition, but it's not really a test for. So I can just ask them at the end of the lecture. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, well, if you want to ask them, I mean, unless someone else has any other questions, if you have, I can do my best on that. Keep in mind, I'm not a nutritionist. So I only know the biochemistry of, of that kind of kind of stuff. Are, AC, are CPG islands methylated or not methylated? Um, well, both, I guess. Um, so CPG islands are located um, upstream of housekeeping genes. Um, and methylated and unmethylated mean different things. Um, methylated means that that gene's gonna be turned on Unmethylated means that gene's going to be turned off. Um, so it depends. And it's just what the signal is. Um, for that, the only thing I would like expect you to really know at this point is like what is a CPG island? And that's just a repeat of C and G's, right? Over and over and over again. And where, where are they located in the genome? And they're located for housekeeping genes. Not all genes have CPGs, but genes that are usually always on um, will have those. What else? And if you don't have anything else at this time, that's also okay. Um, you can always like, in the course of studying, like shoot me an email. I can answer that too. Um, and we don't have to go the full 15 minutes extra if, if nobody has like anything. Because um, what what some students have done in different classes that I think is, and these the students who do this usually do pretty well, is that like the day before the test, they'll just send me a list of questions, um, like like just numbered questions. I'll go through them and answer them. Um, so when studying for this, um, that, that would definitely be something that um, I would encourage people to do. Like when going through the slides, going through the study guides, is there, is there stuff that, you know, doesn't make sense to you, you don't quite get, you know, put a start at that, write it down, 
And then once you've gone through the slides and reading guides like once, um, look at those questions. And after you've read through the whole thing, like, do they still not make sense? If so, just, just email them to me. And if you, if you don't want to meet over Zoom, we don't have to. And I can just type up the responses. Um, if you like a little bit of banter between us while doing that, um, we can always schedule a meeting too. All right, so any, any last minute questions then um, that anybody might have? Um, otherwise, I'm, I might might shut this down if, if, there's, if there's a continual no questions and people are okay with where they're at right now. And like I said, while people are thinking or looking, if you wanna ask those nutrition questions or if you wanna do it privately, Either way. Okay, there they are. In my plant group, dandelion oil is the hot topic. Apparently you're supposed to dry the dandelion before you make it into an oil. Someone asked why and another person commented that decarboxylation to activate the herb and make it ready for your body to use. Is that true? I have no idea about dandelion oil at all. Um, you have to dry it to make it into an oil because that will decarboxylate it. I mean, I don't, I don't know enough about that process at all to say, no, is that true or not? Um, So yeah, I mean, anything I would say about <laughs> dandelion oil is a complete guess because I did not know that was a thing. So I've never looked it up. Do you remember what you told us about virgin olive oil versus not virgin olive oil when we went to the chemistry meeting at UIW? Um, I remember reading something where like the oil, like the oil industry is super sketchy where like virgin olive oil to, to classify as virgin olive oil, you have to have like a certain percentage of like, you know, some kind of lipid. Um, it, it basically, it needs to be pure somehow. And they have some measurements to do that, but nobody does those measurements, right? So you can just slap a label onto the bottle and say, yeah, this is 100% the best olive oil you can buy. And then when you look at it, like 80% of it's like crap oil that's like super cheap, but they're upcharging you because they don't check that, nobody does. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of scummy of that industry, but no one's enforcing it. So you can just say whatever type of oil you want. That's, that's kind of what I remember from, from UIW. Um, dandelion oil is designed to be applied topically, not consumed. I'm always super sketchy about that type of stuff. Um, if you'd like to eat or drink dandelion for its healing properties, you should make it a herbal jelly or liqueur or simply enjoy it as a dandelion tea. Many of those claims, I, um, unless there's like a study on it, I'm always skeptical because it's just, it's so easy to trick people and to get money from them. Like I still can't believe basic water is a thing. Like why would you ever, why would you buy $3 water that's like a pH of like 10? And as soon as you drink it, it's regular water. As soon as it touches your stomach, your, your acid stomach is so acidic, it does not matter. But, you know, that's just my pet peeve. All right, so I'm just rambling on about random stuff now. So last call. Whoa, 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 whoa. Sorry, did not mean to give people seizures. I did not know what I did there. Oh.
All right. Well, again, if there's nothing people want to ask in general, feel free to uh, send me emails. Feel free to set up, like, if you want to have a meeting about topics, feel free to do that. Otherwise, this is the very last time you will probably hear my voice, except maybe next week if we have, if we can schedule that final exam uh, meeting. But this is the last, like, real thing that, that you'll probably hear my voice for maybe the rest of your life. So um, hope you enjoyed my class somewhat in this weird online environment. Um, good luck on test four. Good luck on the final. Um, like I said, just reiterate, test four, a lot of multiple choice, um, some short answers. You're looking at like 40 questions. Um, the final exam, um, it's just going to be a rehash of test one, two, three, and four. Um, no new information. I'm going to ask the same topics. If I did not ask a question on test one, two, or three, or four, I won't ask. Like, so for those, for the final exam, even though I'm getting ahead of myself, um, the topics I'm going to pick from to ask on the final exam are only going to come from your tests, right? So if I ask a question about some topic on one of your tests, it's fair game. If I didn't, like if we went over in class, but I didn't actually test you on it, then you don't need to worry about it for the final. That's a way to make your final easier. Yeah, I think we'll call it here though. Um, good luck studying, study hard. Remember, we have this special provision where you can have until Friday at midnight to take it, um, uh, test four. Um, but yeah, from that, good luck. And hopefully I'll see you next week. Take care, everybody.